All right, uh, so this is the Holy Gospel according to John, the 10th chapter, verses 22 through 30. Glory be to the Lord. And here's what it says. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us pray. O Father, we come before you, O God, to sit at your feet and to learn from you as we hear from your word. We pray, O Lord, that you would open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive, and open our minds to understand. We thank you, O God, that as your sheep, we do hear your voice and you call us out one by one. Father, we are grateful for your call, we are grateful for your invitation, and we are grateful for your word. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, illumine your word to us that we might behold Christ this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So please be seated. Thank you. Glad to see everybody here, all in one piece. Yeah, traffic is uh, traffic is what traffic is, right? Yeah, Mother's Day, right? It's Mother's Day, yep. It's a good day to be a florist. <laughs> so, anyway, we're in John chapter 10, and uh, we find ourselves in today's reading at the Feast of Dedication, where Jesus is in the colonnade of Solomon, and uh, he's being pressed by the crowd, by the Jewish crowd around him. Tell us plainly, tell us already, are you the Christ or not? And he says, I told you already. I've told you, and you do not believe. And he gets into why, but I'm not going to get into that just yet. And he talks about his sheep and how, he, uh, how they, he knows them. They follow him. They know his voice. He gives them eternal life, and he gives the guarantee that they will never perish. But just to rewind a little bit and give you a little bit of background, it opens at the Feast of Dedication, which takes place at Jerusalem. So just to give you a little background, the Feast of Dedication commemorates the rededication of the temple, the Jewish temple, which happened around 164 B.C. And uh, around that time, Jerusalem, as well as the rest of Israel, was occupied by the Hellenists. And uh, there was a particular king in charge. His name was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And he came in and brought the hammer down on Jewish culture. He didn't just occupy Jerusalem. He made it a crime, punishable by death, to observe Jewish ritual, to practice their religion. Things like circumcision, which is critical to the identity of Jewish males. The sa observing the Sabbath which was, if you broke the Sabbath, you could be stoned to death under Old Testament law. But uh, our friend Antiochus made it a, a capital crime to observe the Sabbath. So he was looking to stamp out Jewish culture, period. Jewish religion, Jewish culture. But what broke the camel's back, here's a story that broke the camel's back. He set up an altar in the temple. He set up a pagan altar, an altar to Zeus. And for the Jews, that was the last straw. They revolted. Led by, led by the son of a priest named Judas, known as the Hammer, or Maccabeus. That's why they call it the Maccabean Revolt. Well, the, re the revolt was successful. They were able to restore temple worship once again to its proper place. And in honor of that, an eight-day feast was held. And has continued each year from that time 
even to the present. And it is known today as, anybody? It's known today as Hanukkah, the festival of lights. So in the New Testament, it's called here the Feast of Dedication, but we know it in today's times as Hanukkah. So this is what's being celebrated, the restoration of temple worship. So this exchange between Jesus and the Jews, so that means it's winter, okay? The scripture tells us it's winter, because Hanukkah falls like late November, sometime in December, depending on how the calendar rolls. But the, this exchange between Jesus and the Jews took place in the colonnade of Solomon, which was in the temple complex, just outside the complex. And it was this big covered porch with many, many pillars. And it must have been a very large space because the new church would later gather there. You can read about that in Acts 3 and again in Acts 5, when Peter and John healed the lame man and the Jews crowd around them saying, wondering, how did you do this? That happened in, the, uh, in there. It's called the Portico of Solomon. So... And this is where, after the day of Pentecost, the new church would gather. And Peter and, uh, Peter and the rest of the apostles worked great signs and wonders among them. So you've got this large area that can hold a substantial amount of people. I'm not going to try and give you numbers. But also known as the Portico of Solomon. So you've got a nice, sizable crowd here, crowding around Jesus, saying, Okay, so tell us, are you the Christ or not? Tell us, just tell us plainly. Now, the Christ that the Jews were looking for, and, you know, we, we've touched on this before, the Christ that they were looking for was the conquering Messiah. They were looking for somebody who was going to kick the Romans out and restore the kingdom to Israel. But this was not the Christ that was before them. This was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the Christ indeed. But he answers them. He says, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So Jesus had already answered the Jews, especially if you read through the Gospel of John before chapter 10. If you read through the Gospel of John, Jesus was already answering the question about who he is. He was answering the question of his messianic identity in several ways, but the answer always pointed to his divinity, which the Jews were not prepared to accept. They were looking for a conqueror. And earlier in John's account, Jesus presented to the Jews a list of all the things that testify to him, to who he was. And there were four things that he listed. The first one was the testimony of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we know, was the last in the line of Old Testament style uh, prophets who heralded the coming of the Messiah. But John was able to point him out in the crowd and say, there he is. Behold the Lamb of God. The second witness that Jesus presented to the Jews earlier was the testimony of the works given him by the Father to accomplish. He healed the sick. He drove out demons. He raised the dead. He turned the water into wine. He made the lame to walk, the blind to see. But for some, it was not enough. The third thing was the testimony of the Father. Jesus said, My Father testifies to me, or testifies of me. And the fourth was the testimony of the Scriptures. Jesus said to the Jews, He said, You search the Scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life, but it is those very same Scriptures that testify of me. So for us, the application on that is the place to find Christ is in the Word of God. If we're looking for God's will in a particular situation, if we're looking for God to answer us in a particular situation, or if we're just looking to be with him, the place to find him is in the word of God. You know, people still say, Lord, show me a sign. Well, he had something to say about that, which we'll get to later. But the place to find Christ is in the word of God. And Jesus had also answered the Jews about his identity through his I am statements. I am the bread of life in chapter 6. I am the living bread of heaven from the same chapter. I am the light of the world in chapter 9. And in this chapter, chapter 10, he says, I am the door of the sheep and I am the good shepherd. So he's giving them clue after clue after clue, characteristic after characteristic of the Messiah, 
but they're not listening. And the most dramatic I am statement from Jesus came in chapter 8 and verse 58, where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I love that. I love that. I am. And how did they react? He's revealing the different facets of Christ. He did it in Luke chapter 4 when he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor. And as he sits down, he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They were so happy about it. No, they weren't. <laughs> how did they react to it when he read that? They tried to throw him off a cliff. They drove him out of the synagogue. They drove him out of town and they tried to toss him off a cliff. And then again in John 8, 58, when he says, before Abraham was, I am, speaking the forbidden name of God in the process, they tried to stone him. They, pick up, they picked up stones to stone him. So, and they pressed throughout the Gospels, they, they pressed Jesus for a sign so that they could see and believe him. And they told him straight out, well, what sign do you perform that we might see and believe you? They wanted revelation on their terms. And we have to be careful when we ask God, oh, Lord, just show me a sign if you want me to do this. Because we're asking for revelation on our terms when he's already given revelation on his terms through the word, which is illumined by his Holy Spirit. Jesus said an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. So we've got to be careful when we ask for that sign. Jesus had given to the Jews all that he was going to give them in terms of his identity, but they still would not believe. Now, it was enough for those to follow him because he had followers. He had the 12 apostles. He had all the other disciples unnamed who were following him. It was enough for them because the disciples had seen the same signs, the same wonders, they had heard the same declarations, the same teaching as everybody else, and they believed. So why didn't these Jews believe? What was different about them? The answer, next week, when we, no, I'm just kidding. The answer was stunning. He said, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Let that sink in. He did not say you are not among my sheep because you don't believe. He said you don't believe because you are not my sheep, among my sheep. That statement carries eternal implications. Because I'm going to read to you from Matthew 25, uh, from thir verse 31 to 34, and then 41. Listen carefully. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. He's talking about when he returns now physically as the conquering Messiah. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, that would be the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is a word of judgment. When he says, You are not among my sheep. When we see here what's going to happen with the sheep and the goats when the Son of Man returns, they will be among the goats. They will be among the ones that, G, that, hear the, that hear the phrase or the sentence, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, earlier in, in John chapter 8, Jesus said, probably to the same group of people, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Again, that's a very, very clear statement. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And here he indicts them again. He says, the reason you do not believe is that you are not among my sheep.
But there's good news for those that are his sheep. And that's what we'll look at now. And by the way, the title of this message is Blessed Assurance. And we'll see why as we go with this. As we go through the rest of the text. He says, my sheep hear my voice. As, as we pick up, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, immediately preceding the passage that we read today, we're in John 10. The first 21 chapters, or the first 21 verses, I should say, of John chapter 10 is the Good Shepherd Discourse from Jesus, where he says, I am the good sheep, I am the good shepherd. He says, My sheep hear my voice. And the references to sheep and the sheepfold and the shepherd in this discourse would have been very familiar to those that were listening to Jesus at the time, because every family had sheep that they that they kept for personal use, whether it was a few, whether it was a, a, a whole flock, or is it a herd? A flock of sheep. Mm-hmm. Well, they kept sheep. All the families kept sheep. And some, you know, were kept in pens next to the house. In some instances, there was a common pen where all the sheep would be herded into. The sheep would go to the well together. And sheep of different flocks could be kept in a, a common pen because the shepherd, when he came, when a shepherd came for his particular sheep, he would use a distinct call or a whistle or maybe a small flute which the sheep would recognize and follow. Some shepherds even gave their sheep names. But the sheep would know the call of their shepherd. So if my sheep were mixed up with yours or with yours, when I came for my sheep or you came from yours, all you had to do was call them, give your distinct whistle. And your sheep, the sheep that belonged to you, would separate themselves and come out and follow the shepherd. So keep that in mind as Jesus goes through the rest of this discourse. So he says, I know them. He goes, my sheep hear my voice. Yes. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. So in his earlier reference to the good shepherd, Jesus says, I call my own sheep by name. Or the good shepherd, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. You know, when you want to speak to somebody, what's the first thing you do? You get their attention, right? If I want to talk to Debbie, say, Debbie. She'll turn around and say, what? All right. Yvette wants to talk to me, she'll say, Frank. I'll say, what? She'll start talking. When Jesus calls us out, he calls us out by name. So we, when we heard the gospel, he got our attention first. It's not, it's not this, you know, there is a general call that goes out for men to repent. But what we're talking about here is the effectual call of the Spirit to the elect of God, the believers of God. So when you heard the gospel, God had already gotten your attention. And you were able to believe. You know, this is part of the, what will be called the golden chain of salvation. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 29 and 30. I'll just read that real quick. It says, For those... For those who he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be com, uh, conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who, whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's what's known as the golden chain. So the first link is predestined. The second is called. The third is, I'm sorry, the first is foreknew, the second is predestined, the third is called, the fourth is justified, and the fifth is glorified. So when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, it's not the, it's a very intimate knowing, you know, as, uh, as in the sense of a man, know, how a man knows his wife, that intimately. So God set his love upon us. Before the foundations of the earth. When he says, I know them. So when Jesus says, I know them, I know them because I've set my love on them from eternity past. And then he says, he calls them by name. He calls them by name. He doesn't reach into a hat and say, oh, oh, Debbie's a winner. No, he knew you. He loved you. He knew you. He loved you from eternity past. He said, I'm going to call this one.
So Jesus guarantees that all who receive that effectual call will come. He said earlier in John 6, he said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. He didn't say, all that the Father gives me, I hope will come to me. Or all that the Father gives me, if they exercise their free will and choose me, will come to me. He just says, all that comes, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Why is that? How does that happen? Well, there's two reasons. It's one, because they are drawn by the Father. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And later on in that same chapter, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So there's the first part of the guarantee, why they will come. The second reason why Jesus can guarantee that they will come is that they already belong to the Father. What? Yeah. They already belong to the Father. In John 17, in his high priestly prayer, well, let me rewind to John 6, when he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Well, that's the first, there's the first point. All that the Father gives me will come to me. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, he's, when, as Jesus prays to his Father, he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. There it is again. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept their word. So before we said yes to Christ, we already belonged to the Father. Just let that sink in. You already belonged to the Father. He had determined that you were his and he was going to give you to the Son. Jesus goes on in his high priestly prayer. He says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. There it is again. This wasn't random. The Father chose us, selected us, predestined us, and then called us. Jesus goes on, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And although we didn't read this verse, the very next verse says, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Here again, he's giving him a direct, clear statement of who he is. And what's their reaction? They want to kill him. Again. So when Jesus says that no one can snatch us out of his hand, that includes us. Just as no external person, power, or principality the devil, demons, anything you can think of. There's nothing that can take you out of the Father's hands. But we have to remember something. That includes us as well. We cannot disqualify ourselves from the kingdom of heaven. We cannot. Once we've been saved, we can't walk away. You know, I became a Christian at age 19. Uh, I was young dumb, didn't know a lot. And I uh, went to a church, the same church from that year, 1979 up to 1985, and then that church broke up suddenly. And I wandered for 18 years. You know, tried to go back to church for a little while. And, uh, you know, but eventually just stopped going. And I got to a point where I thought I might just walk away and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done being this Christian. I'm done. And it was the word of God that stopped me cold. When I got to that point, what the Lord shouted in my ear was from John 6, 68. When Jesus had given a very tough teaching to his disciples and most of them left he says, uh, I believe it was the teaching, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And a lot of the followers up to that point tell, this is a hard saying, who can, who can take it? And they stopped following him. And he was left with the 12. And he said, he 
He says, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That was the question that stopped me. Do you want to go his way as well? And there was no other answer. Like, where else am I going to go? So Jesus, the good shepherd, calls each one of us by name. He leads us to eternal life. You know, that's an echo of Psalm 23 that we read, that we read earlier. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall, not, I shall not want. He leads me besides green pastures, besides quiet waters. So he calls each of us by name, and he leads us to eternal life, and he will never cast us out. That's his promise. He will never cast us out. Now, we shouldn't take that as a personal challenge, but he will never cast us out. And he will raise us up on the last day. This is the will of the Father. It's not Jesus came up with on his own. This is the will of the Father. This is part of his work that he's carrying out. So the presentation of the saints, the, the pre, I'm sorry, the preservation of the saints, or the perseverance of the saints, is actually a Trinitarian undertaking. The entire Trinity is involved with keeping us in the palm of his hand. We're given to the Father, or we're given by the Father, because we belonged to him already. We're given by the Father to the Son, and the Son, who will not cast us out, redeems us by his atoning work on the cross, and he gives us eternal life. And the Spirit seals us and is the guarantee of our, inhabit our inheritance, as it says in Ephesians. Spirit seals us and is the guarantee of our inheritance, which will come to us when Jesus fulfills that last promise to us, I will raise him up on the last day. So we are kept by the Spirit of God until Jesus raises us up on the last day. There's no way out. Who would want to leave? But we're not going anywhere. God is keeping us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are holding us in the palm of their hand. We are safe. So, what are we to say to these things? This is from Romans 8, 31 through 39. What are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have indeed a blessed insurance. Amen.